gestión y gerencia en diversas organizaciones. Su experiencia incluye trabajo en temas de política pública, estrategia corporativa y comunicaciones. Actualmente, desde The Breakthrough, coordina proyectos público-privados entre emprendimiento de alto impacto y competitividad y clusters. Les damos a todos la bienvenida. Faltan 10 minutos para las 4 y los voy a dejar con Catalina para que introduzca nuestros invitados del panel. Bueno, pues muy buenas tardes. Eh, yo quiero que esto sea, quiero ante todo darle la bienvenida a nuestros panelistas. Eh, estamos esperando que aún nos llegue, creo que dos más que se nos volaron del salón. O no sé si están aquí y quieran subir. Eh, lo que quiero es que esto sea una conversación. Me pidieron muy especialmente los organizadores que no hiciera introducciones largas para que entráramos directo en materia. Solo quiero dejar dos cosas planteadas. Eh, que los he hablado un poco con, con los que he tenido la oportunidad de hablar previamente. El gobierno tiene un marco y yo creo que está lleno de buenas intenciones, pero como dice el aforismo del diablo, están los detalles. Y en la implementación, como un poco se mencionó esta mañana. Entonces, un poco el sentido de este panel y el sentido de este foro en general es que podamos eh, escudriñar a fondo eh, de la experiencia de estos panelistas algunos de esos detalles de la implementación. Entonces vamos a comenzar con el doctor Guillermo Fernández. El doctor Guillermo Fernández es el director del el presidente de la Fundación México Estadounidense para la Ciencia. Eh, me está contando que está viniendo a Colombia desde el 71. Eh, y yo creo que es muy interesante entender esta experiencia particular mexicana. Y voy a ir presentando a cada uno de los panelistas, la medida que les voy dando la palabra. Recuerden ir pensando sus preguntas y circularlas para que tengamos suficiente tiempo al final para un buen diálogo. Voy a ser muy estricta con el tiempo para que tengamos ese espacio de conversación al final. Muchas gracias. Pues, muchas gracias, muchas gracias a todos los organizadores, en particular a don Fernando Chaparro. Yo estoy muy impresionado de ver cómo Colombia está avanzando en este terreno. Creo que las presentaciones de hoy, las discusiones que sé que tuvieron ayer, algunos comentarios que escuché antier en la noche discutiendo precisamente todo este tema de las estrategias de innovación, pues indican un gran compromiso en algo que para mí es súper crítico para un, un esfuerzo sólido de desarrollo económico. Eh, me voy a permitir hablarles de esta estrategia integrada de fortalecimiento e internacionalización de empresas de base tecnológica y espero que no me vaya yo al extremo en cuanto a lo que nos pedía nuestra moderadora, de entrar a, a los aspectos ya del detalle. La verdad es que nosotros en FUMEC, la Fundación México-Estados Unidos para la Ciencia, pues trabajamos desde hace muchos años en estos temas y hemos venido construyendo toda una serie de experiencias y lo que les voy a relatar, pues es realmente un poquito la, la peli, no tanto la película, sino más bien la fotografía actual. Algo importante es que en México se han ido desarrollando muchos programas del gobierno, particularmente del gobierno federal, pero también de los estados para impulsar la innovación. Algo que, que creo que debo de decir, aunque a lo mejor resulta un poquito chocante, es que en México, afortunadamente en los últimos años, se dejó atrás el paradigma de que la mejor política industrial es que no haya política industrial. Desgraciadamente, durante muchos años, esto ocurrió en México, no se quiso eh, intervenir como un punto de apoyo eh, para impulsar la innovación y el desarrollo de las empresas, particularmente de las pymes, y eso generó problemas muy serios que afortunadamente ahora se están resolviendo. Eh, en los programas que nosotros tenemos en FUMEC, en realidad cumplen un papel, como ustedes lo van a ver, de catalizador, de facilitador, para que las empresas y las organizaciones que las apoyan puedan entender y aprovechar mejor los grandes programas del gobierno. Nosotros lo van a ver, trabajamos con muchas empresas, pero en realidad lo que hacemos es facilitarles el que aprovechen adecuadamente todos los programas que hay para lograr que sean empresas globales innovadoras. 
Lo que se ha buscado en estos programas de México es que la, haya empresas con más capacidad, que tengan más acceso a la investigación, que cuenten con personal especializado, que apoyen la innovación en general, que coincide mucho con lo que se definió en la mañana como varias de las líneas de estrategia de innovación aquí en Colombia. Eh, una de las medidas que en México ha tenido más impacto en, esta, en este contexto fue la creación de la subsecretaría para la PYME, que permitió concentrar recursos en programas de aceleración, de incubación, de emprendimiento y también en programas de innovación e internacionalización de las pymes. Que esto coincide con varias de las observaciones que se han hecho en la mañana. Un desarrollo integral no puede ser local, tiene que ser global. Y hay una serie de programas del CONACYT también, de estímulos a la innovación, de apoyo a proyectos de investigación, de incorporación de maestros y doctores, que han tenido bastante éxito y que nuevamente sirven de apoyo a las a empresas tecnológicas que nosotros apoyamos. Algo que para nosotros ha sido clave, y lo, lo mencioné hace un momento, son también los programas estatales. Ustedes van a ver que nosotros trabajamos con los estados más conocidos en México, Jalisco, Nuevo León, el Distrito Federal, pero con muchos otros que ya han logrado armar estrategias locales muy sólidas, muy interesantes para impulsar la innovación en las pymes. Ahora, le voy a dar en dos brochazos muy breves, ¿qué es FUMEC? FUMEC, la Fundación México-Estados Unidos para la Ciencia, es una organización no gubernamental, somos independientes de los gobiernos, pero fuimos creados por los dos gobiernos, el de Estados Unidos y el de México, cuando se estaba negociando el Tratado de Libre Comercio, allá en 1992, el año próximo cumplimos nuestros 20 años. Y con un propósito muy, muy simple, hacer que la ciencia, la tecnología y la innovación sirvan para el desarrollo y que se aproveche adecuadamente las experiencias de Estados Unidos y también de Canadá y otros países para acelerar lo que se tiene que hacer en México. Nosotros en la, en la Fundación Ligados con Innovación tenemos dos grandes líneas, educación para la innovación y por otro lado, innovación en las pymes. De educación para innovación, trabajamos a nivel básico, sistemas de indagatorios de enseñanza de la ciencia, a nivel de educación media superior, bases de ingeniería y enseñanza por proyectos en la educación media superior, y desde luego es en especialidades relacionadas con los nichos de empresas tecnológicas que tienen un gran potencial y con las que están trabajando con nosotros, en la educación superior. Quise mostrar aquí brevemente lo que estamos haciendo en educación básica, preparar y motivar a los niños para el aprendizaje autónomo y la solución creativa de problemas, que es muy semejante a lo que ha venido así, aquí, haciendo aquí en Colombia el programa de pequeños científicos, siguiendo los modelos de Estados Unidos, de Francia, que ahora se están generalizando a muchos otros países. ¿Qué se busca? Traba, a que aprendan, desde luego, a observar, preguntar, elaborar hipótesis, etcétera, pero también a trabajar en equipo. Y otra cosa que para nosotros es fundamental, ser proactivos. Y eso en mucho depende de tener seguridad en su capacidad de aprender. Cuando una persona no tiene seguridad en su capacidad de aprender, tiene miedo de entrar a cosas nuevas. La innovación es entrar a cosas nuevas. Si una persona no tiene seguridad en su capacidad de aprender, le va a tener miedo a una innovación, ya sea en producto, en proceso, en modelo de gestión, en lo que fuera. Porque le da miedo, no, no entiende, le cuesta trabajo aprender. Entonces, necesitamos que desde los niños se desarrollen las bases para tener seguridad en su capacidad de aprender y obviamente una capacidad real de hacerlo. En cuanto a las pymes tecnológicas, que es el tema en donde yo quisiera pues, tener un poquito más de impacto, nosotros trabajamos ya con 1.627 empresas, eh, les voy a mostrar cifras que incluyen eh, todo lo que es hasta diciembre de 2010, hasta esa época teníamos 1.237, y la mayoría están concentradas en nueve sectores, se los voy a comentar, y en 14 nichos. 
El modelo que hemos trabajado empezó hace más de 15 años con un proceso de apoyo local a las pymes y ha ido evolucionando para hacer ahora un proceso en el que la empresa desarrolla visión global y capacidades para alianzas nacionales e internacionales. Y algo clave en el modelo que hemos construido es crear, impulsar, trabajar con redes, redes locales, redes nacionales y redes internacionales en un contexto en el que se habla una red con otra. Esta es nuestra presencia, ustedes van a ver que estamos en los eh, estados más importantes, pero cubrimos ya una parte muy importante de la República. Estos son los nichos en los que operamos, hay nichos, por ejemplo, como de pruebas clínicas, dispositivos médicos, eh, eh, trabajamos mucho también en cómputo en la nube, tecnologías móviles, o sea, son ya nichos muy específicos, en donde hemos encontrado empresas exitosas y donde hemos construido todo un armado de redes que nos permiten apoyarlas. Esta para mí es la, la lámina más importante de la que traigo en esta presentación. El proceso que hemos construido con mucho apoyo de la Subsecretaría para las Pymes, de la Secretaría de Economía y también de muchas de las organizaciones empresariales y de apoyo precisamente a la innovación en México, tiene tres niveles. Como les decía, un primer nivel es el nivel de abajo, el del SATE, de Asesoría Tecnológica Empresarial, que es un proceso muy semejante al del Industrial Research Assistant Program de Canadá, que es para ayudar a entender a las empresas y ayudarlas a generar una estrategia que les permita eh, tener interés en proyectos de innovación, en mejoras eh, integrales, en alianzas. Después, el, el otro elemento que me parece que es muy importante es el elemento de arriba, es lo que nosotros le llamamos la punta del iceberg, porque es lo más visible de todo nuestro trabajo. Es una red de aceleradoras, de empresas tecnológicas en Estados Unidos, en Canadá y en Europa, que sigue creciendo. Y la parte intermedia, que es precisamente lo que nos permite ayudar a que se integren todos estos elementos con un enfoque específico al éxito de la empresa, que eso es lo que nosotros buscamos. El sistema de asesoría tecnológica empresarial es en realidad como una puerta de entrada a todo el sistema FUMEC de apoyo a las pymes tecnológicas. Por ejemplo, una empresa, Ironbit, es una empresa dentro de un programa bastante grande que tenemos de apoyo al desarrollo de empresas que hacen aplicaciones para dispositivos móviles, llegó con nosotros a través del SATE en el 2008. Tenía seis personas y eran buenos para todo. Ahora, es una empresa que ya pasó por el proceso de aceleración internacional, el proceso de TECVA, que está trabajando con bancos, que está trabajando con docen desarrollando docenas de aplicaciones especializadas para comercialización de productos, tiene más de 110 personas. Les decía que el SAT es esencial para conocer a las empresas y para facilitar su desarrollo con innovación y visión global. Algo clave es que este sistema de asesoría tecnológica empresarial selecciona las empresas y selecciona las que tienen mayor potencial de crecimiento en función de los nichos en los que está y del potencial de los directivos de las empresas. El SATE tiene una serie de instrumentos que hemos ido integrando de las experiencias del IRAP de Canadá, del Small Business Technology Development Center de Estados Unidos y de muchas otras organizaciones y es en realidad un articulador de la empresa con los mecanismos de apoyo. Algo importante es no confundir con los gestores de las universidades. El SATE trabaja en función del interés de la empresa, no va a vender algo que vende la universidad. Es una extensión de la empresa que busca lo mejor para la empresa y la ayuda a armar programas adecuados con ellas. Déjenme pasar... Aquí está un poco lo que, la imagen de lo que nosotros vemos del SATES como un médico de las empresas. 
es un médico generalista que cuando identifica problemas, busca al especialista y logra que la empresa se integre precisamente con él. Déjenme pasar ahora a lo que les ponía yo a nivel intermedio, que es esta barra de lo que son los, las coordinaciones que hemos creado de nichos. Los nichos son para articular acciones que benefician a empresas de un mismo tipo y facilitan la integración de redes nacionales, permiten compartir experiencias, recursos, programas de las diferentes regiones del país y facilitan la interacción con redes internacionales. Por ejemplo, en aplicaciones para dispositivos móviles, tenemos varias redes que están trabajando con RIM, que están trabajando con Nokia, que están trabajando con eh, las plataformas de Android, que están apoyadas por Wavefront, que es eh, nuestro socio en la aceleradora que tenemos en Vancouver, que es una organización especializada en aplicaciones para dispositivos móviles. Ahí lo que estamos viendo es que armamos toda una serie de programas de capacitación, de asesoría, de diagnóstico, de fortalecimiento de las capacidades locales en función de lo que se necesita en cada nicho. Y desde luego eso nos, nos permite ayudar a desarrollar los ecosistemas locales. Ahí, por ejemplo, estamos armando varios laboratorios de apoyo al desarrollo de aplicaciones móviles. Les decía, estos son los principales nichos en los que estamos, no voy a profundizar, esta es nuestra presencia estatal. En los nichos lo que hacemos, como les decía, son estudios de tendencias y oportunidades, programas de formación de recursos humanos, implementación a nivel de, del sistema de asesoría tecnológica empresarial en cada región y la organización ya de, de programas con clústeres y con parques tecnológicos. Y eso pues, nos lleva a tener una interacción muy fuerte con los gobiernos estatales, buscando desarrollar, como en este caso en el, en el Estado de Morelos, en el tema de biotecnología, talleres, congresos, atracción de empresas ancla y desarrollo de todo un conjunto de empresas asociadas a ese sector, aprovechando una infraestructura muy importante de investigación, de desarrollo, de, de capacidad empresarial en el tema de biotecnología que existe en ese estado. Déjenme acabar con el tema de, de TECVA, Aceleración Internacional de Empresas Tecnológicas. Aquí algo que quiero destacar es que nuestro propósito fundamental es facilitar la interacción de las empresas con entornos internacionales que pueden impulsar su crecimiento acelerado. Esto obviamente nos lleva a que vendan más, pero no solo es que vendan más, queremos que la empresa aprenda, que la empresa se desarrolle, que la empresa construya alianzas que le permitan mejorar toda clase de, de procesos internos. Los empresarios desarrollan su visión de negocio internacional para construir negocios competitivos y de rápido crecimiento. Esto es clave, o sea, lo que andamos buscando es el cambio en la visión, en la cultura de los empresarios. En este programa, como les decía, ya tenemos ahorita más de 500 empresas. Tenemos ocho aceleradoras internacionales, cinco en Estados Unidos, Silicon Valley, Austin, Michigan, Arizona, dos en Canadá, Seattle, eh, perdón, dos en Canadá que son Montreal y Vancouver, aquí me equivoqué, y una en Europa, Madrid, en España. Algo que es importante es que las TECVAS, como les llamamos, también se están enfocando a los nichos y esto con el apoyo de esas coordinaciones de nichos. Entonces, lo que estamos tratando es de que desde lo que se construye abajo, a nivel de, las, de cada una de las regiones donde trabajamos, hasta lo que se construye arriba, en, en estas aceleradoras internacionales, vayamos dando prioridad a ciertos nichos, en donde vemos que existen grandes oportunidades para México. Aquí están, pues, algunos de los, ahora sí que son docenas y docenas y docenas de aliados que tenemos. Eh, yo quisiera destacar aquí la Universidad de Texas en Austin, que ha sido para nosotros un gran apoyo en la cedora que tenemos en Austin. En Montreal, te, nuestro principal asesor es apoyo es Innocent, una organización espectacular también en cuanto a su visión y su capacidad de apoyar a las empresas tecnológicas y equivalentes que tenemos en prácticamente todas las otras regiones, además de contar con asesores en lo personal 
que trabajan con nosotros, coordinados por nuestro personal de cada aceleradora, para ir apoyando al desarrollo de las empresas en cada nicho. Esta es la visión de cómo ha ido creciendo el programa. Eh, lo vamos a estabilizar, queremos madurar, no vamos a seguir creciendo tan rápido. Eh, estas son algunas de las empresas que han crecido sus ventas internacionales en más de un 100%. Les quiero mostrar dos casos o tres casos muy brevemente. Infolink, por ejemplo, es una empresa de Ciudad Juárez que llegó a, con nosotros cuando tenía 40 empleados y otra vez de tecnologías de información diciendo que podía hacer de todo, outsourcing, software a la medida, lo que quiera. Trabajó con un grupo de asesores que le pusimos en Silicon Valley, se enfocó a business to business, a apoyar la utilización de paquetes sofisticados en empresas medianas y ha logrado crecer, ahorita tiene más de 150 empleados y de esos son más de 100 ingenieros que ha contratado en Ciudad Juárez. Esta empresa se la presentamos al presidente Calderón, el presidente de México, hace unos meses que estuvo con nosotros en, en California, y lo que comentábamos es, el presidente andaba buscando que llegaran más ingenieros a los centros de investigación de Hewlett Packard, y ahí tenía una empresa pequeña mexicana que estaba contratando cientos de ingenieros, gracias a tener una visión muy clara de un nicho específico de mercado, y a tener capacidades muy importantes en la selección de ingenieros, la capacitación de ingenieros, el apoyo formal a la función de los ingenieros para poder ofrecer un servicio que está teniendo un impacto formidable. De los pantalones a los interiores de los aviones. Sois es una empresa de Chihuahua que hacía jeans. Llegaron nuestros amigos de China, la borraron del mapa. Decían, mi experiencia es el hilo y la aguja, ¿dónde puedo trabajar con valor agregado? La llevamos a la aceleradora que tenemos en Montreal, empezó a trabajar con nuestro equipo de asesores especializados en todo lo que son interiores de aviones y fíjense los resultados, de 2009 a 2010 ya creció en un 75%, ahorita ya tiene 140 empleados y métanse por favor al sitio de internet, ya están produciendo balsas de las que salen de las puertas de los aviones, ya están produciendo los interiores que van en medio entre el, el, la cubierta de, del avión y la, el exterior del fuselaje, pero con un compromiso de los empresarios impresionante, una capacidad de escuchar, una capacidad de trabajar en forma consistente, sistemática, disciplinada y por otro lado, una enorme capacidad para integrar una capacidad técnica que les ha permitido tener aliados tecnológicos austriacos, aliados eh, tecnológicos franceses, cumplir con todas las certificaciones, dentro de toda la estrategia sistemática, consistente, de día a día que, que tenemos de apoyo a este tipo de empresas. Camarón Sustentable, otro ejemplo de perseverancia, de visión empresarial y de consistencia en el trabajo. Estos amigos se acercaron nos, con nosotros también alrededor del 2008, ya tenían una tecnología para producir algas, en forma prácticamente industrial a muy bajo costo, como alimento, querían hacer alimento para perros, empezamos a estudiar el mercado, empezamos a analizar las diferentes opciones que tenían y encontramos que su, su nicho era camarón. Y han logrado, después de todo un esfuerzo muy largo de desarrollo tecnológico, de pruebas, de sistematización de todos sus procesos, de conseguir capital ángel, de entrar a los mercados más sofisticados de Estados Unidos, ya lograron certificaciones de Comorón Sustentable, que ahorita es una gran oportunidad en los Estados Unidos. Órdenes de compra, Inversión Ángel, están en, en la instalación ya de su primera producción industrial, con contratos de compra con algunos de los principales compradores y un potencial ya muy claro de llegar a, a 200 millones de dólares de ventas en cinco años. Muy bien. Bueno, déjenme nada más como un punto prácticamente final. Esto nos ha ayudado mucho en las negociaciones que tenemos con nuestros patrocinadores, la Secretaría de Economía principalmente. Lo que les hemos demostrado es que el, lo que llamamos el retorno, que son las ventas internacionales divididas entre lo que recibimos para operar los programas, ha ido creciendo, ya ahorita es del orden de 7.5 y va a seguir creciendo. De, aquí hay, para los que quieran después ver en la, la presentación, todo, algunos detalles de cómo operamos. 
La, la base de TECVA, como les decía, es generación de un modelo de negocio internacional, un enfrentamiento directo a las condiciones del mercado, que es lo que permite entender lo que necesita la empresa para mejorar, un aprovechamiento del de ecosistema para que haya todas las alianzas y los elementos de apoyo adecuados, fortalecimiento de la capacidad empresarial y una maduración empresarial internacional dentro de un contexto de dirección estratégica. Pues les agradezco mucho su atención y pues me da mucho gusto que ha habido mucho interés en algunas conversaciones que he tenido por acá con algunos de ustedes y la verdad es que, como decía al principio, estamos en la operación práctica, Obvio, tomamos en cuenta los grandes modelos y sabemos de Porter y sabemos desde Schumpeter hasta quien ustedes quieran, pero nuestra realidad son las empresas y nuestra motivación es el éxito de las empresas y la innovación es un medio para lograr que las empresas tengan éxito. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias al doctor… Fernández. Ahora seguimos con Peter Rickjap, que nos va a ilustrar un poco acerca de un mecanismo en especial de vouchers en Holanda, eh, que se ha utilizado para promover la innovación en las pequeñas y medianas empresas. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairperson. What I would like to uh, share with you in this uh, second afternoon session is uh, some sort of a, uh, a new experiment. And let me try to illustrate this experiment um, as follows. In all our countries, whether this is in Latin America like Colombia or in Western Europe or in China, All governments are heavily investing in knowledge. We have created universities, we have created high schools, we are investing heavily in all kinds of educational systems. And that's good. It's good for society, and it helps us to solve important problems in our society, medical problems, social problems, technological problems, and so on. So this is the positive side. The question we have in almost all countries is whether this whole body of knowledge which we have created in all our universities and uh, research laboratories, etc., whether somehow it reaches the industry or maybe governments so that they can use that knowledge so as to improve their performance and to improve also their innovative uh, capabilities. Now, in the past decade or so, there has been enormous debate on the knowledge society and whether this is good for industry. But time and again, we see many instances where despite an abundance of knowledge of clever university professors, students, etc., it does not reach the final user, i.e., the industry. That has been discussed also extensively in the literature. Some of you may be known, may be uh, familiar with uh, the distinction which has been made by two authors, Gibbons and Novotny, on what they call mode one and mode two. Mode one means we have knowledge and we hope it filters down to industry. Industry will hire good students and they gradually will incorporate the knowledge. Mode two means that we have some sort of an interaction between industry and universities and high schools and so on and research libraries so that collectively we can develop better knowledge which is more directly usable. Uh, this has uh, led to quite some uh, debate also in the recent uh, discussions on science policy in different countries and uh, discussions on national innovation systems, discussions on regional innovation systems, which knowledge model serves innovation best? That is in fact the question. Now at the beginning, 
the solution was rather simple because most of the universities said, well, we have to improve our science communication. We have a special office. We tell the world what kind of knowledge we have and everyone can try to use it. Science communication. Um, and most universities nowadays have what, they, what is often called a TTO, a technology transfer office, a TTO, technology transfer office, so that the user, industries, etc., if they need information, they can go to that technological transfer office and try to get solutions for their problems. That was, in a way, rather successful, but not always, because if you are a small-scale entrepreneur, and you have a certain problem, small logistic problem to be solved, I, I bet if you would go into the beautiful University of Rosario here in Bogota, you get lost. You say, this is my problem, but who can help me? No one in the entry can help you to solve your problem. You don't know where to go. There's even not an entry to get to the right people, the right department, the right scientist. So despite all the efforts, science communication, science marketing, etc., it has not been so successful. Technological transfer offices have helped a little bit, but not so much. More recently, we have had a long debate also within the university system on what is called science valorization. Science should have, and research should have, an economic value, valorization. That has been enormous debate, also in the United States. Some of you may be familiar with the Bay-Doll Act, the Bedoll Act in the United States more or less specifies that universities can use public money so as to generate knowledge for the private sector. That was a revolution in the 80s and it has been heavily criticized because scientists said, well, we are independent and we do not want to be driven by industry and by politics. But things have changed and gradually we have now even moved re more recently toward science commercialization, which means that Science can have a commercial value, not only a societal value to help solve problems in society, even a commercial value. That's a new step. And uh, that has, in fact, uh, led to quite some new perspectives in different countries, not only in the United States, but certainly also in Western Europe, where a significant part of the university system nowadays is driven by the public task. If you get public money, it should be to the surface also of society and the economy. But it has taken almost 20 years to get from the first steps to where we are now. What I would like to do now is the following. Just share with you an experiment. When um, our new government in 2002 was installed, the prime minister has created by then what is called an innovation platform. An innovation platform was a platform with 12 people, captains of industry, a few influential people, and a few scientists. And I happen to be a member of that, sign, of that innovation platform. And the first idea is the following. If you talk with the, the minister, with the cabinet, etc., what kind of innovation policy would we need? The first question was, how can we better use the existing knowledge? And then some sort of a double-track system was uh, developed first. If you look into big industry, normally they have their own research divisions. If you talk with Ericsson, if you talk with Philips, if you talk with uh, many of the bigger uh, multinationals, they have their own laboratories, their own staff, thousands of people. They do not want to be so much influenced by uh, the public sector. But the main problem and that's the second track. The main problem, of course, is the small, medium-sized enterprises. And as uh, you know, in Colombia, but also in uh, the Netherlands, the biggest share of the whole economy is small, medium-sized enterprises. One person, the owner of a small shop, a few employees, up to maybe 100 employees, but most of them rather small business activities. And all, most of these SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises, are involved almost in a daily fight how to survive. Because many of them go bankrupt. And approximately 30% of all the starters are bankrupt in one year because they are not clever enough, not innovative enough, etc., etc. So they may need new knowledge and new strategic insights, but they don't have even the time to collect it because they are busy 
in just collecting their daily activities and trying to survive. I give you one example. I've done a, re a project on the trucking sector. So just trucking, big cargoes, etc. And ask them what kind of logistic information would you need in order to survive. I called the, the owner of a truck company. He said, well, I, have, I would like to know, but I have no time. And he said, well, I would like to talk with you. He said, I have no time. He said, well, the only way to talk with me is join me on the truck. And then during the truck trip, we can discuss. They were so busy, they even could not think about getting new knowledge. And this is a standard recipe and standard problem in, in many of the SME uh, sectors worldwide. So most of the innovation does not take place in all these SMEs, though there's a lot of entrepreneurial capacity but simply they don't have the skills, don't have the time, uh, nor the mechanisms to get this done. And here comes, in fact, the experiment which we have tried out in the Netherlands. We said, if the knowledge which is available everywhere, from universities, um, colleges, etc., does not flow into the industry, especially the SMEs, maybe we have to reverse the system. It should not be maybe a supply-driven system. It might be a demand-driven system. Ask the client what they would like to know. Now, of course, if there is not a financial incentive involved, the system does not work. So what we have done is, um, and I just guide you quickly through this uh, presentation, is in the framework of debates on national innovation systems and regional innovation systems to see whether we can systematize in a conceptual framework this model and come up with smart policy conclusions. And uh, so we made a distinction in our analysis of this whole SME sector, sources of information, the innovation capabilities, the innovation performance, that's what you would like to have at the end, and the commercialization sources. There's a whole set of data behind, but I just go quickly through all the things. And then um, what we did is um, to introduce a demand-driven concept of what we called innovation vouchers. And what is an innovation voucher? If you are a small-scale entrepreneur, you could just send in a one-page request. I have in my company this and this problem, which I would like to be solved, which has to do with knowing more about certain systems, technical things, social things, legal things, what have you. And that one page, very simple, so it only needed one hour to fill out a simple form, you had to send it in to the Minister of Economic Affairs, and that was screened. And then, if it was, if it was accepted, you would get a so-called innovation voucher. What is an innovation voucher? It means here you get a piece of paper. It says value of approximately $10,000, US dollars. 10,000 US, that's the value. It's not that much, perhaps, but it's just sufficient for a small-scale entrepreneur to have a problem solved. So you get this voucher, and if you are accepted, and the entrepreneur can take this voucher, and he goes to any university, any college, any research laboratory, and says, well, I have this problem, this is my page, this is the voucher, you solve it for me. So it was completely demand-driven. That turned out to be a formidable success. The minister, for the first time, I think he had reserved some 10 million US dollars. In one year, he had already spent 30 million US dollars on all these vouchers. And uh, in the last year, it was more than almost 150 million dollars. A fantastic model, low scale, uh, low scale model, very simple. And it was good for the small-scale entrepreneur, he could get immediately an answer. It was also good for universities. It was not a big amount of money, $10,000, uh, but for a faculty or for an individual re small research group, it's nice to get some extra money. And it's also good for the research staff to be involved in very practical things. 
And of course, you had to write a small one-page report, but the main question is, was the question solved? If the question was solved, you got the money, and so quite some indirect money has been spent in this way in the, the university system. Then after a couple of years, of course, this is all public money, as you can understand. After a couple of years, the question came up, did it help? Everyone was enthusiastic, but it's not a guarantee that it really helped. And this is public money, so it has to be carefully checked whether it really reached its purposes. So then we were asked to make an assessment of the success or the failure of this whole mechanism. It could fail. And uh, so here we have built up some sort of a conceptual model where we used innovation sources, innovation capabilities. Then we got the innovation performance, the sales performance, the location, whatever. Did it help? And of course, you had also the local and regional perspectives. So this was a conceptual model. Then we sent out survey questionnaires to all the individual entrepreneurs who had received this voucher. And we asked them to fill out a simple questionnaire. I can tell you, we first started on the university side. We asked the university, you got all these vouchers, thousands of them. What is the success? It turned out the universities had no idea because the central registration of all these vouchers is lost in universities. They go to faculties, individual groups, to laboratories. Universities are not the right organizations to be accountable for the success of this mechanism. But we went to the individual entrepreneurs, so the demand side, and they were very happy. They said, okay, we are pleased to help you, etc." So uh, we did a whole uh, analysis of all the questionnaires, trying to find out whether or not it has helped, how much it has helped, under which conditions, uh, suggestions for improvement, and, and so on. So here I, I just uh, used a few technical things which I would not like to discuss. We had a few uh, hypotheses formulated whether university contact has a positive impact on the development of new products and services, the whole series of hypotheses which were tested by sending out the survey a questionnaire, etc. I just go quickly through all the, the statistics. Uh, I think you will be believe all the statistics. And at the end, we use even some more sophisticated econometrics, but it doesn't matter. I just come back to some of the hypotheses. Does it help? And indeed, um, it, it turns out that under various conditions, this for most of the small-scale entrepreneurs, thousands of them in the country, it had been a simple but very effective way of solving their problems. A whole series of site conditions, and in view of the time, Mr. Chairman, I will not go to discuss all the things. The same, another hypothesis, whether um, higher innovation capabilities lead to higher innovation performance of a particular SME firm, and again, there uh, we were able to find the conditions under which, like organizational talents, etc. Um, and finally, also whether higher use of commercialization sources leads to a higher innovation uh, performance. And again, it turned out that this whole mechanism, we looked through all the, the uh, conditions, etc., turned out to be rather successful. So, all in all, we came to the conclusion that the use of a rather simple demand driven instrument which in principle would cover more or less 98% of all the business life in a country, was rather effective. It was not that expensive from the perspective of the public budget because you cover in principle 98% of the whole economic activity in a given uh, country. So um, also in view of the whole debate on whether public knowledge is suitable for industrial applications, I think our answer has been rather unambiguously and definitely yes. It's very efficient. It's good for the knowledge institutions, universities and laboratories and research institutes as such, because they are forced to be very practical in terms of their mission, not all over, but for certain parts, yes, to be very practical, solution-oriented on the one hand. And on the other hand, it led to a decrease of the barrier between small-scale business firms and universities. And uh, so from that perspective, this also has been a rather interesting success. And I just would like to tell you a little bit about the success of this instrument, which is also continuing nowadays. And quite some money is spent, but apparently the SME sector is very much in favor of this new type of experimental uh, mechanism. Thank you very much.
Bueno, ahora continuamos con José Manuel Mendoza de la Universidad de Porto, Portugal, con su presentación que se llama El fomento a la innovación por medio de redes de ciencia y tecnología, un nuevo paradigma para, para la comercialización de tecnología. Les recuerdo que si tienen preguntas, creo que están repartiendo los… allá atrás hay eh, quien está repartiendo los papeles para hacerlas, eh, los, si no los pueden ir pasando y quieren dirigírsela a uno o varios, eh, se los agradezco. Bom dia, boas tardes, uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank for the invitation and congratulate for the organization, uh, particularly Fernando Chaparro. And uh, I would like to tell you that I'm delighted to be here, although my video does not work because the sound is not working. But anyway, I think I can do the presentation in the same. Um, I hope to share with you the experience uh, of a program in Portugal, and that this can be of value all, all, for all the actors that in, in Colombia are working in technology transfer and commercialization. Before starting with the slides, let me put the context first. Portugal is a small country, 10 million people uh, and 5 million plus immigrated all around the world. For the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a consistent strategy investing in science and technology uh, PhDs, science projects, collaboration with companies, etc. Because of this and because of the other factors, uh, mainly uh, the, the, the absor absorption of Portugal in the European economy, the economy and in this, in the industry are under transformation. And uh, for Portugal, exports are crucial. Our economy is very, very much uh, towards the exterior. Uh, there are traditional sectors like shoes and textiles and garments, cork, wine, ceramics, where now we can only export top uh, products with design and high-end projects. For instance, in shoes, we have to compete directly with Italians. Otherwise, the labor costs will not allow us to export anything. But also cars, machines, software, services, uh, etc. Portugal is considered a moderate innovator in Europe, in the European, uh, in the European Union Innovation Scoreboard, and is trying hard to reap the economic benefits of the investment that has been doing in science and human resources for the last 10 or 15 years. Has been investing in universities, research labs, science parks, and techno technological centers. The results, the results are here already. There are uh, companies that collaborate with university, shoe companies, car industry, uh, energy companies, and there are spin-offs that are now in the international markets. And some of them were sold to Microsoft or to Intel for 50 or 100 million euros. But these are exceptions. So we need many more of them, and we need to raise the overall, the overall level. That's in this political context that this U10 program has started. So th what is the argument? The argument is that you need critical mass. And if you don't have the critical mass inside, you have to have the critical mass abroad. So you have to link to international networks. And the, the discussion is how to build a platform for stimulating international science and technology transfer and commercialization, helping Portuguese companies to be in the international markets with technology. And the evidence is a few successes uh, and the first results of, 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 this, of this program. So this is the video that is not working. Uh, the mission then of this program is internationalizing the training of technology transfer. 
creating a network with all the Portuguese universities, science parks, and incubators. Uh, if you look at this graph, uh, you see that uh, in 2010, so the, the last statistics, uh, in 35 countries in Europe, Portugal in the global innovation index is number 19, which is roughly halfway, not, not too bad. There are some indexes we are even better than Spain and Italy. But if you go down, you, you see that we are, uh, companies are innovators, number five, individually, but the economic effects are number 25, which means that the economic effects of this investment are not, are not yet there. So in 2007, uh, the, the policy decided uh, to launch a program of collaboration with the University of Texas in Austin, Carnegie Mellon University, MIT, and Fraunhofer, uh, to train uh, the people, the staff of the technology transfer offices at the universities in technology transfer. Uh, so all public universities were put together because it would be without sense and it would be too expensive to do this for just one university. So all the system is uh, in it, plus some leading polytechnical schools, research labs, and incubators. And how do you do this training? You do this training bringing international experts to Portugal for workshops, discussions, case-based discussions, uh, but you also do the training sending people abroad for on-the-job training in US, in different places. Uh, then uh, this program has some follow-up, observation and assessment, looking at what are the impacts of, of, of the program. And the institutionalization means that trying to bring everybody together to create a network independent from, from the government. This is an example of activities in, 99, uh, in, in 2009, 2010. Uh, workshops with different universities, for instance, Cambridge or uh, Carnegie Mellon, or uh, in workshops with different uh, international experts from different universities uh, in some areas like marine and bioscience or like bio nanotechnology. So thematic uh, 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 training or training on models, bringing the different models. No model is applied directly to Portugal. MIT has a very particular model. MIT has not even an incubator. The incubator is Greater Boston because it's a very special uh, context. But in Austin, you have a, an incubator and a very good incubator. So we have to try to learn with all, all, all these experiences. Uh, the training weeks is just for staff of the technology transfer offices that are doing work, uh, deals, negotiations of licenses, capital sourcing, uh, venture creation, etc., cetera, and, and, and writing contracts with companies. So this is more advanced training for the senior staff of the universities. Uh, and then the internships that were done in these two years in uh, seven different locations, mainly in the US, but also in Cambridge, in the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, and the European Space Engine in, in Europe. And in the US, uh, most of them were in Texas, uh, and they were, uh, they were uh, mediated by University of Texas at Austin and IC Square. Um, so what are the results of this? First, we have some quantitative results. There is a stronger network of uh, technology transfer offices in Portugal. People that were working uh, with their backs uh, on each other, now they know themselves. They share experience, they share know-how, they help themselves. There are new networking opportunities and there is an improved uh, skills for all the professionals. Uh, like all programs, we have the highlights and the, the lowlights. To be optimistic, the lowlights, we say it's to, to be done, not done yet. Uh, the highlights are then the recognition of this network of competence in technology transfer by the researchers and by the industry uh, the other very important is the involvement of the rectors of the universities, because when it all started, the rectors of the universities, large universities like Porto University, which has uh, 30 or 35,000 students and lots of staff, many, fact, many, many schools, they don't even know exactly what the technology transfer office is doing. So to 
to call the attention, to draw the attention of directors and of the vice directors for research and innovation and external relations was very important. Then the internships, sending people abroad for, for periods between three and six months to really learn how to do things and uh, build networking in US mainly and also uh, help spin-off companies to uh, onshore technologies at US, so to enter the US market uh, because it's, uh, in the case of Austin and, and Texas, it's uh, an easier way in than California or, or, or Boston where competition is very tough. So just to finish, I will just briefly present you two case studies. Uh, two, two real persons from two universities which are not even the, the best or the, the largest or the more important one uh, to see what, what they gained and what they, they have done. Uh, this guy, Marlos Silva from the University of Aveiro, which is about 60 kilometers south from Porto, he went to the Office of Technology Commercialization of the University of Texas at Austin and he learned how to organize activities, operations and procedures in a technology transfer office. And he established some relation between that University of Texas Office of Technology Transfer, uh, te Commercialization and University of, of Aveiro in Portugal. So this was very, very important. Uh, but doing this, he actually did work. Uh, if you look on the right, he did 17 technology screens with the help of American experts. Uh, he looked at market evaluation for some of them. Uh, he had initiated some negotiations, working in three different licenses from technology, uh, and, and negotiated some two onshore deals uh, of uh, Portuguese companies to go into the U.S. So he learned not from theory, but with actually cases in different areas. Uh, and this is, was the, 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 main, the main outcome. Uh, Carlos Mascarenhas from University of Trajos Montes, north, east, near Spain, uh, the smallest of the universities collaborating in the program. I, I chose this example to see that it's possible even in a more remote place, in a smaller university. Uh, and, and she was, uh, uh, she, she went to the South Texas Technology Management because the university where she comes from is strong in agro industry, wine, etc. So we have to to, 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 to ask for a correspondent good partner. Uh, she was doing also some uh, uh, market research and uh, uh, training on licensing and negotiation of deals with industry. Uh, and, and, and in the end, she worked also and she, she did some screening and some prospects and raising some interests of American companies. So these are two examples. Uh, in these two years, 2009, 2000, there, there were 21 people trained in different areas, in different places. Uh, the universities was chose, uh, have chosen the areas and the partnerships that they thought they were the best for their interests. Uh, and, and, and we have some preliminary findings that uh, we have to go on with the systematic training of technology transfer offices uh, for some years more because this, this uh, started four years ago, uh, we are now in the fifth year, like someone said in the morning in, in, in one of the speakers, uh, this is like buying a dog, so the dog now has four or five years, but we have to feed it until it's 14, and then you have to buy a new dog and go on. Uh, institutional building was very important, so now all the universities in Portugal work with this network. Uh, business development for global born startups, the drama of the spin-offs from the university is that they cannot do like 20 or 40 years ago that a company was uh, starting uh, uh, and, and then she would start uh, selling for the nearby markets and then she would, uh, the company would extend to the country, then to the nearby country, etc., etc. Spin-offs now are born global uh, and the first sales may be done outside of their own country uh, and when they put something in the market, they have to aim for the world, which is very difficult in a company which may have five people, ten people, and not too much money. So business development, helping global-born startups is very important. And finally, assessment and observation, which is very important because of the, like the previous speaker mentioned, accountability and knowing where we put public money, which is taxpayers' money. Uh, with this, we, we try to show that what in the beginning seemed impossible, 
it's just difficult, not more than that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Uh, while I introduce Bob Hodgson, I'm going to say this in English because I know that those of you who have translation will get it and this way I can activate the conversation with our panelists. Bob Hodgson is the, the director of uh, the Cerniki Group and he's also a professor at Cambridge University. He's worked as an international consultant for the World Bank in um, entrepreneurship and um, tech parks. Um, one thing I want to tell Bob right at the beginning and so that we can have this in our minds while we're listening to his conferences. Recently, Colombia has embarked in an um, international study as to where it stands in terms of entrepreneurship with the help of many chambers of commerce. I see some of the financiers sitting here in the audience. And uh, the two main obstacles that the entrepreneurs are uh, signaling as the most important in terms of entrepreneurship are, first of all, mentality. A mindset and second of all financing so I think what Bob has to tell us today in terms of innovative financing strategies is very relevant to our country thank, thank you very much Katarina um, hello everyone it's great to be here um, I've got two objectives one is to try and keep you awake for the next 20 minutes uh, you've been extremely good all day and the other is to kill you by PowerPoint uh, if you're not already dead so, um, I'm going to focus on uh, finance, but I'm not only going to talk about finance. Where I start with is the question of what a firm's need. Because finance has to fit within other assistance packages. It isn't something you provide of itself. Sure, when you go and talk to companies, whether these are existing companies or whether these are entrepreneurs who are trying to set up their companies, the first thing they'll tell you about is money. They want some money, please. They can't get it. Um, usually that leads you into seed and venture capital. The second thing after they've got that off their chest is to tell you about know-how. They need people with the right skills to work with them to enable them to do what they want to do. The third thing they are emphasizing is information. And typically, this is not technical information because usually in this particular context, we're dealing with people who understand their technologies. In fact, who are usually world leaders in their technologies. The information they desperately need is on markets because they need to know how to make a business. They need to know who to, to whom to sell and how best to do that. And then finally, they need the right infrastructure. And I'm gonna say a little bit about some of the hard infrastructure as well as the soft infrastructure. I'm not expecting you to read this. <laughs> This is just to tell you that there's an awful lot that you need to do to help these companies in each of these dimensions. And the consequence of that is that no single agency can do it themselves. And in terms of the roles of often universities, um, they're very clever. There are lots of very clever people who can tell you all the answers about how things should be done. But by and large, they don't have the first idea about how to start doing them. Um, they'll tell you how to do it themselves, and many of them do, and I'm going to come on to incubation in a second. Uh, they can't. They have to build networks. They have to share visions of what they want to achieve with other people, and they have to attract the best of breed providers. They have to build successful commercial companies. Those words are not common words in universities. The idea of a university being a commercial entity is something fairly novel in the academic community. And of course, they have to promote entrepreneurship. When we're talking about innovation, we're really talking about the competitiveness of companies. And there really are only four strategies. We have to either work with existing companies to improve their productivity, or we have to create new companies that are themselves of higher productivity. And that's the area I'm going to focus upon. But there is, of course, the third strategy, and we heard a little about that in the, uh, the presentation Peter made on, on China uh, of attracting firms from outside who themselves have technologies and higher productivity. And of course there's the fourth strategy which Guillermo has just described to us in Mexico with TechBA, which is taking our existing companies and finding new markets and helping them to grow through extending their businesses internationally. 
When I come to a new country, and I've done this in about 40 countries now, I re usually start with three hypotheses. And this is the first one. We've got great science and technology, and we've got great ideas for new businesses. We've got lots of these. They're, they're just there. But we haven't any money to take them forward. So the first proposal, and this is a key proposal in your innovation strategy, let's build a venture capital industry. Easy to say. This is the, my little diagram of the commercialization cycle. There are various stages through which you must go if you're going to build world, world competing businesses. And a venture capital industry isn't a homogeneous thing. It starts with angels, it then has early stage seed funding, it moves on to more formal venture, venture capital, and then eventually ends up with management buyouts or uh, trade sales or launching on a stock exchange. The key thing here is that you have to articulate that. It's no point putting one of those pieces in place. There are, traditionally there are gaps that are found very frequently. And it's appropriate to focus on the gaps, and I'll talk a little about that later. But you must have an articulate financial system that enables you to link all the way through. Otherwise you'll get firms that may launch well, may start well, but then they'll stop. And you won't get the real impact that you gain. The other key thing about this diagram is that at each of those stages, there's a very different package of assistance needed. There's a very different package of technical skills that are needed to support those companies. And there's a very different package of mentoring required. So again, the single use of the word mentor, we're going to develop a mentor network, uh, is something which is much more complex th than just making that statement. My, my second hypothesis that I start with is in countries where they say, oh, we've got lots of money and we are prepared to invest in new businesses, but there's not enough good ideas coming out of our knowledge base. Our scientists don't understand and they don't help us to, with good ideas. So the orientation there is, let's change the science base. Let's make a, a rather different model of knowledge generation that will then be relevant to our business community. The third hypothesis is we've got great science and technology and we've got lots of money. The problem is that the two communities can't talk to each other. They have no experience of connecting. They have no history of connecting, and they haven't even a language to develop that will enable them to talk to each other. They use different concepts, they've got different values, they have different cultures. So the essence of that part of the strategy is to try and build a shared vision and try and learn a common language and try and get both types of the communities on board. I'm, I'm new to Colombia, but my guess is you've probably got all three of those because all the other countries in Latin America I've worked have all three of them. Um, this is part of keeping you awake. One of my favorite um, film directors uh, is, a, is, a, is a Spanish film director called uh, Almodovar. This, this film is called uh, Habla con él, uh, which in English came to talk to her. And essentially it was about um, two couples, uh, or sorry, a couple who, uh, the woman had had a traumatic accident and was in a coma, and she was placed in the same room as another woman who was in a coma. And the advice from the nurse to the boyfriend of, of the woman who was in the coma was keep talking to her. She may not appear to listen, but keep talking to her. And you have to do that. You have to keep talking to the academic community, and you have to keep talking to the business community, so that eventually they give in and change, and they start talking to each other. I'll give you some Latin American examples of some of the projects um, I've been involved with, um, mainly through the World Bank. In Mexico at the moment, they're starting a thing called UVTCs. Um, these are, uh, it's, a, it's a rather special way of saying technology transfer office. Now, what's interesting here, and it's some of the lessons that Jose has, has described that Portugal learned, the UVTCs are not located within a single academic institution. The UVTCs are not academic institutions. They are private companies. The universities are members of the company, or the public research organizations have shares in the company, but there are also venture capitalists there. There are also business service organizations there. So you have a, 
a, a group of people who understand the dynamics of the academic sector, but also are business oriented. Because if you're going to commercialize technology, you have to migrate it from the point of, and, and this is an important step, the point where you are getting to the stage where you have an intellectual asset, the IP system, through a point where you actually make money out of that IP intellectual asset, the commercialization system. And the emphasis here is to emphasize the commercialization part, not the intellectual property part. So the UBTCs will not own the intellectual property. It's an experiment that's just beginning. I'm really excited about it. I think it will work and I think it will make a big difference. In Argentina, we're trying something completely different. There, we've um, seeded a number of consortia whose job is to find deals for the venture funding industry. Because often, ideas need to go through a lot of stages before they're ready for investment. And again, these consortium that are being built include an academic partner, they include a finance partner, they include a business services partner. They are being encouraged to work either in particular regions or in particular sectors, and they are being rewarded by their successes. They're not being paid just to play, they're being paid to be successful. And the, reward, the mark of success is that they attract venture funding for these new ideas. Uh, in Chile and Argentina and Mexico, we've gone down the consortia route. Here we've built different ways in which the academic community works with the business community. The first step was to actually get them into a contract together. The second step was to get them into a contract with each other. And the third step was to get them to invest in research and development agencies that will do focused work that is relevant to the business but is also academically interesting. The uh, model upon which this is based is the Technelia model um, that's come out of uh, the Basque country, Pez Vasco, uh, I, I think some of you will be familiar with that because I think it's one of the, the world's best models. Um, the Tech BA model has already been described to you. That's another program that we're, uh, we've, we've been watching and, and encouraging. If we look at the academic community, they've gone through various stages. Now, I've called these plan A, B, C, and D. Um, the original stage, and some academics are still in this, is that um, Commercialization isn't our business. So the real challenge is to establish what I call legitimacy, to get people to be persuaded in the academic community that this is part of their job. And that's, as Peter said, has taken 20 years in Europe to get to that stage. Uh, I'm sure you can accelerate it here. The second level is what I call benign neglect. And I, I'm based in Cambridge in England, and we have a reasonably good university and we have a pretty dynamic high-tech business sector. And part of the reason that arose, because the university did not take any ownership of the intellectual property that came out of their research programs. They just neglected them. But they were benign in their neglect. They encouraged their faculty to do something about it. And enough of them did to begin a momentum. And now we have a critical mass of something like 1,500 companies employing 35,000 people. And this is in a little town of 250,000 population. So you can see the intensity that's grown there. The third is the stage that many European universities are at, and some of yours are beginning to, which is develop a TTO. They're developing processes to take technology commercialization seriously. And the fourth stage, which most universities haven't yet reached, but some have, is that this is part of their core business. It's something they do themselves. And again, Jose described the U10 uh, experience in, in Portugal. And what he didn't say was that I sit on his external review committee. So I keep poking him to do better. And that's, put, that's an important part of the process, to have people who know better to help you to encourage yourself and to challenge yourself. Um, he knows that the rectors are beginning to wake up. So they're really in, in stage in plan C, but we really move to, need to move them into plan D because we want the rectors to say, this is sufficiently core business, we'll pay for it out of our core budgets. And that, that's the stage we want to reach. Okay. This is another film which I didn't like, but won an Oscar. Um, it, it was a, um, a film where Bill Murray, um, someone of about my age, was lost in Tokyo. 
uh, and he met this beautiful woman called Charlotte Johansson. And somehow they got, up, got together. That's never happened to me. It's a moral hazard, but it's never happened to me. Uh, so it's pretty unrealistic as a film. But there was one joke in the film, which is, aren't the Japanese funny? They do funny things. And what I learned from that is that culture is crucial. So the culture of your universities is crucial. The culture of your businesses is crucial. When you come to the universities, there really are only four commercialization routes that they can take. The first is the simple one, let's establish intellectual property, and then somehow we get commercialized. The second is the creation of new businesses, which we're going to discuss in more detail. The third is establishing strategic alliances. That's where you get the demand side working with you on the research questions that eventually then end up in products or processes. And the fourth, and this is little discussed, is getting your faculty out there into business and getting them to take advisory roles. Now, there's always been a certain amount of this. It's, it's part of the gray economy of the academic sector. What we need to do is to bring it into the headlights. And we need to establish it so that every academic thinks about working with companies and thinks about advisory work. And if you build that into the incentives in the university, then you'll get a much different culture in your university. We've talked a bit about the Bay Dole Act uh, as it being one of the key things that helped American universities to go through. There's different programs here, some of which you'll be familiar with. I just want to highlight the last one. In Norway, they went even further. The Norwegian government placed a duty on every university, on every vice chancellor, to report on his technology transfer activity and his commercial work with companies every year to parliament. He has a duty to do that. Not, not voluntary, he must do it. Now, if you tell the vice chancellor of a university, you're gonna have to stand up in front of a committee every year and tell them what you've done. They take it much more seriously. Norway is the only country I know that's gone that far, but it's interesting. To manage the culture change in universities is also something that, that has to be taken seriously. Um, I used to think there was an academic gene, but I've now realized that academics are normal. And that they're normal in two respects. The first is they respond to incentives. So if you get your incentive structure right, they'll change their behavior. The second is they're normal in the sense of the normal distribution. You know, this, this bell-shaped curve, okay? At this end of the bell-shaped curve, you have your friends. They'll always work with you. That's not a problem. At this end, you have the purists. They'll never work with you. They're very vocal. They'll tell you you're undermining the culture of the university. Listen to them, pat them on the head, and ignore them. The real challenge is the center of gravity of the university, which is the majority of the academics who, by and large, don't care. The leadership of the university has to shift the center of gravity towards your friends to build legitimacy for this type of activity. So that's how academics are normal. You go through different processes. You have formal protocols. Uh, you have what I call ferrets and gorillas. This is the, again, this is the, the early stage where people go underneath the university. They don't try and make an alliance with the university. They go underneath the university and they find friends and they think, oh, that's an interesting idea. Let's pull it out. Let's make a business out of that. The university gets no payback for that, so it's pretty destructive but you sometimes do get businesses. The real challenge is to get it into the core business. And this, really the level there is the research team. Uh, and a lot of what uh, Jose's been doing in Portugal has been about trying to get that research level uh, to take this agenda seriously. I was gonna say a few words about incubation and incubators. Those are two different words which I, I use selectively. An incubator is a building where incubation may happen. Incubation is a process, and that's the thing you should be emphasizing. But in terms of the place, the building, you have to design it well, and there are good, good models of designing good incubators. There are bad models, so please don't make the mistakes that other people have already made. Make it very flexible. Crucially, remember exchange. The most important part of an incubator, there's two parts of it, one is the coffee shop, that's where people meet. And the second is the entrance. If you go to an architect and say, build me a building, he'll think, how many people are going to come into this building? I want to avoid them uh, being congested, so I'll make 17 different doors to get them into the building. No, have one door. You want them to be congested. You want them to meet each other every morning. You want them to bump into each other. You're increasing the likelihood of people with different ideas meeting each other 
Exchanging those ideas and creating new businesses is a consequence. Make sure you provide grow-on space next door because your building will quickly get full and they'll become your children and you don't want to ch throw your children out. So the building will get clogged. Make sure you've got somewhere to push them. And then make sure you do that very, very firmly. Okay. The process starts before the business idea is, is, is pledged. So you have to work on pre-incubation. You have to provide space for these types of entrepreneurs who've got an idea but it's not quite ready yet uh, to launch their business. You've got to have a, sa a service emphasis. And I don't talk about business planning and I don't talk about marketing strategies. I talk about sales. That's the most important thing you can do for a new business. Get them a customer who will buy their product or service. That will give them a customer, it'll give them a reference point, it'll give them revenue, it'll give them confidence in what they do, and they'll do more. That's the most important thing you must do. So you launch with a clear plan, and then you graduate firmly, you kick them out. But you retain them in your network, because they're the role models for your next generation. They're the guys that have done it. They know, they've got the scars, they can come back and help the next generation. One of the things that's been repeated several times already in the last couple of days, and I'll repeat it again, only a minority of startups will come from the science base. Uh, the 1,500 companies I mentioned in Cambridge, and we have either, we arguably the best or the second best university in the world, only 100 of them have come out of the university. That's okay, but the other 1,400 have come from somewhere else. They're all science-based, they're all linked to the university, but they didn't come out of the university. So bear that in mind in terms of building your networks. And even when they come out of the university, they usually end up with a combination. It isn't a single person, it's usually a group. And sometimes that group has to include people who understand business as well as people who understand science. Because new technology businesses need to be commercially oriented from the start. And the, the, the final thing I'd emphasize to you is emphasize knowledge, not research. Some simple definitions. Knowledge is what we already know, and there's a huge amount of that that is not currently used. Research is what we do to find out what we don't know. And the outcome of research is often completely uncertain. So don't focus on research activities in the university, focus on the knowledge that's in the university and find some mechanisms to draw that out. I'll come back to this one. Um, this is the core of, of what I'm gonna talk about in a sense, because it's the, it's the funding stuff. Uh, and I want to focus on tier one and tier two, angels, the rather patronizingly called three Fs, friends, fools, and family, people who lend money to new entrepreneurs with a rather different value system than a financier, then into seed funding, the early stage formal funding, through to venture capital. And it's that, that two and three area that I want to focus on. The real problem is filling the gaps because there is not an articulation of finance. And there's a particular prevalent problem virtually everywhere I go of early stage capital. It's not there. And there are real reasons why it's not there. Usually, when firms are at that early stage, they only want a small amount of money. They don't want millions. They only want 50,000, 100,000. And that's difficult because it's too small for people who are trying to manage a large fund. And it also means that the transaction costs of providing that $100,000, euro, whatever, is usually very high. So it's much easier to make a deal with 10 million because you can do all your proper due diligence and you can have a professional budget. To make a deal with 10,000, you can never get back the amount of transaction costs you've made to make the right choice. You have asymmetric information. You don't really know whether these guys are capable of running a business you have a larger scale of risks, and the ri risks come from the technology. Will this new thing work? The risks come from the team. Have, do, are these guys capable of running a business successfully over the long term? Have they the energy? Have they the persistence? And have they the stamina? Another set of risks come from the market. This, this may be whizzy, it may be brilliant, but who's gonna pay for it? Who's gonna buy it? Are they gonna pay enough to make it, the last risk, financially worthwhile? Is he gonna provide me with a model that generates profit? Okay. The challenge for the funds, and I've seen many countries that have set up these early stage funds, is finding the deals. Um, 
it's easy to set up a fund. It's much more difficult to get a quality of deal because the risks are there, it's difficult to assess the potential, and it's difficult to make the right deal. And the final thing that's worth bearing in mind on these things is that you have to work out your exits before you enter. If you're going to run a successful fund, you have to know where this firm's going to go after you finish with it. And that's even more difficult to predict. Um, this is another film. I thought I'd end with this one. Um, this is a cartoon that many of you may have shown to your children. I quite enjoyed it myself with my grandchildren. Um, it's about super people who become a problem and are put in a box and told, go away. But really, we quite like them being super, and they, they, can, do help, they can help us. So being super can be great, but it can be part of the problem as well. So don't, what we have to do is build a culture where ordinary people make these businesses, not super people. Thanks, guys. Bueno, como decía Bob, esta es la hora dura, la después del almuerzo ya aquí cuando estamos terminando. Quiero que esto sea muy conversación. Yo, más que, que concluir, quiero como resaltar algunas de las cosas que, que les oí, eh, que me parecen eh, muy interesantes. Quiero de nuevo darles ese marco de este estudio, porque creo que aterriza muchas de estas cosas y nos puede dar un marco un poco por alrededor de lo que está saliendo en Colombia. Entonces, les repito un poco para, para ilustración de ustedes. Al preguntarle al emprendedor, porque hay muchos estudios que le preguntan a la, a la población en general cuáles son las barreras y cuáles son los inhibidores del emprendimiento, en Colombia salió de primero el tema de mentalidad y cultura, de segundo el tema de financiación, eh, de tercero eh, el nivel de importancia que le dan y su grado de apalancamiento para poder emprender, eh, todos los temas asociados a habilidad, talento, legislación eh, y en un grupo de abajo toda la organización de soporte, que digamos, sé que muchos de los que estamos acá trabajamos en organizaciones que de una u otra manera hacemos soporte, y los temas de infraestructura y carga administrativa. Les quería dar ese marco porque creo que es interesante para, para poner las preguntas que le quiero, que quiere hacer el público y que quiero como resaltar. Eh, sobre la presentación del doctor Fernández, yo creo que el tema de que la innovación y el, y el emprendimiento son un fenómeno eminentemente local, y ese salto de lo local con un paso intermedio al tema internacional, eh, hay un par de preguntas alrededor de eso y, y quisiera como, como resaltarlo. El tema internacional, eh, en la presentación de José Manuel, eh, así como la de Bob, es claro que el tema de hacer un poquito de, de piggyback o de, de salto trayendo, te, tra, trayendo tecnología en lugar de tratar de de generarla localmente en términos de las aceleradoras. Me parece muy interesante que el modelo de, de FUMEC de una vez sale de la región y tiene la aceleradora por fuera, lo cual es un, un modelo que yo por lo menos en lo que he visto de Colombia no, no lo he encontrado. Un tema que me encantó de la presentación de Peter es la innovación de la estrategia para la innovación. Y como sé que muchos de los que estamos aquí tenemos que salir a hacer ese tipo de, de, de actuaciones con nuestras organizaciones y demás, Creo que uno no puede dar lo que no tiene. El tipo de, de planes que son, copiémoslo, traigámoslo, creo que ese, ese ejemplo de Holanda de ser innovador en la forma como va a innovar haciendo este experimento, arriesgándose a, eh, con el sistema de voucher, todo el tema de meterse dentro de la cultura un poco purística de la universidad, que es otro de los temas que yo creo que salieron en todas las presentaciones, creo que de, de nuestros expositores. Eh, y que encontramos en el estudio, como es un est el estudio que se hizo en Colombia, es un estudio comparativo de países, les cuento esta anécdota, cuando se le preguntó a un, pro un profesor de una universidad que fue eh, encuestado, hay una, había unas preguntas acerca de si la universidad estaba participando activamente en la generación de negocios, y el profesor llamó a decirnos que la pregunta debía estar mal, o sea, el tema de la mentalidad va tan atrás que le pareció que eso claramente ni siquiera se podía preguntar. O sea, el tema de ese purismo académico como un, eh, como un eh, inhibidor a el tema de juntar industria con, con universidad no sale de manera muy reiterada y creo que lo señalaron acá varias veces. Eh, a, el, en el enfoque de Bob tenemos el tema sistémico, que creo que está metido dentro de, dentro de todo la, el diseño de la política, pero que él lo decía muy claramente, es muy fácil declarar y es muy difícil de hacer. 
eh, vamos a hacer redes de ángeles, vamos, eh, hay un tema que es transversal a todo eso, todos mencionaron lo delicado que es el tema de los fondos públicos para este tipo de cosas. En Colombia además tenemos nuestros, eh, cargamos nuestros, eh, nuestras historias alrededor de ese tema y es una pregunta que yo quiero dejar, que le quiero hacer y quiero enmarcar dentro de esto. Eh, estamos pidiendo que se tomen riesgos, que se meta el gobierno a ayudar a generar una industria financiera para temas que son de muy alto riesgo. Estaban mirando estadísticas de startups eh, eh, backed by VC, de Venture Capital, y de, hay, hay cifras contradictorias, pero dos de cinco o tres de cinco no tienen una salida exitosa, fracasan. Yo quiero saber qué va a pasar en Colombia cuando el gobierno invierta en esas que van a fracasar. Y parte de todo el tema de innovación parte de que hay unos fracasos. Entonces, ¿cuál es la mejor forma para que el gobierno y para que las entidades se paren ahí? Y ahora sí, sin más demora, voy a algunas de las preguntas. Eh, preguntan, ¿cuál ha sido el papel de las universidades y su relación con la industria en estos procesos de innovación y comercialización de tecnología? Esa pregunta se la voy a dejar a José Manuel y a Bob, un poco para compartir eh, otras respuestas y que nos agilice el tiempo. Otra cosa que quiero permitirles es si les que se quieren preguntar entre ustedes un poco para que nos fluya más la conversación. Okay, I'll write in English. I can understand Spanish, but uh, speaking is another matter. Uh, okay, the role of the universities in, in, in Portugal is is changing very fast uh, because of these policies I have uh, uh, told you, but but we are still. Uh, below if you compare with the US or with Anglo-Saxonic universities. But I think we are not worse than French or German because in Europe, universities are quite conservative in their relation with, with industry and with society. And this academic purism is, is still prevalent. Everybody worries very much if you, the government, if the government or someone tells you should finance applied research, which is social relevant and has potential economic impact, People say, ho, ho, what about basic research? Are, not, uh, are you not finding basic research in Portugal anymore? So uh, still these things are evolving, but are, are, are evolving very slowly. But in Portugal, there is a, a, a model of research labs associated with universities, but outside of the universities, that were created about 20, 25 years ago. The, the universities are shareholders, they command these research labs, but they are privately run, completely privately run. And in some of these labs, I would say a, a good quantity of these labs, it's possible to organize R&D in a different model. Because you can attract the researchers from the universities, the principal the investigators. You can hire scholarship holders PhD students and postdocs. And you can hire professionals, engineers. You can hire people that are able to sell technology to a company, to negotiate a deal. So you mix different, uh, different people. You mix the, the academic researchers, the young blood, and the professionals. And then uh, uh, you can conduct Uh, research to be socially re relevant and to have potential economic impact. In university it's not possible because the freedom of, of choosing whatever the theme of your research is complete. So anybody can choose to make a research on anything that uh, this person would, be, would think that's very interesting, uh, even if this thing will not lead to anything. I was told by a Portuguese which lives in the US for 30 years now an IEEE member, a top person, that uh, NSF, well, some, some um, conservative senators uh, asked uh, some experts to analyze a good bunch of National Science Foundation projects. And the conclusion, if this is US, it's that the outcome is good for nothing. It was money thrown to the drain, thrown to the drain during five or 10 years to these research groups. So, uh, Academic community wants to have this freedom of doing whatever they like, even if the impact in society and economy is zero. If you run it privately in this model, 
you uh, can bring stimuli, uh, like it was said, I think, today or in the morning or in the afternoon. You can bring exact stimuli. Why not, why not the university people? Why can't they get money on the projects they do with industry? Why can't they increase their salary? In my institute, people can double del their salary in the university, paying taxes, and being paid through the university, which charges an overhead, and they can double it. They, 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 they earn 4,000 4, 4, euros, or 5,000 euros, or 3,000 euros being a professor, and they earn as much as that in doing uh, projects with companies. What, what, what is the problem? And they publish in the best journals. So, it's, it's, some people said, okay, you cannot do everything. You cannot teach, do research, and work it with companies. But this is an excuse, because it's much harder to do a good contract with a company if you, sometimes you have to go there during the night because the, the, the factory is closed during the night to test the prototypes and to test the things. Then doing one more paper, which is maybe 60% equal to the previous paper, which was published in another journal or in another conference. So it's much more difficult to do real work and to produce science with economic impact than producing just papers. Um, I'll answer this in three ways. The, the first is the most simple. Uh, what's the role of a university? It's to be the best university. Um, and by that, I mean it has to be the best at teaching, because that's one of the absolutely key roles of a university. And, and is one usually understated in this discussion because we're emphasizing the direct commercialization of ideas. But the main way in which universities um, impact on the economy of the country is through teaching young talent. We can then have a discussion about what they should be taught and how they should be taught, and what skills they need, and what's the balance between tacit knowledge and, and hard knowledge, between academic knowledge and applications knowledge. Being the best university is the, is the key problem. The, I, I blame the Germans and the French. I'm British, after all. Um, I blame the French because most of, most of Latin America follows a European tradition. And I mean continental Europe rather than Anglo-Saxon Europe. Um, and that was a guy called Napoleon, who has all these codes. And wh why is that important? Because what, what your mindset says is we need a law to tell us what to do. We need a law to frame how these institutions sh should be given a role and should be given a purpose and should be governed. The Anglo-Saxon model is the opposite. If there isn't a law to stop me, I can do it. So I can go out quickly and do whatever I want and be very flexible and very, very easy to change. I don't need a law. So there's a, there's a fundamental problem uh, in terms of the flexibility that you need to be a really innovative economy. The reason I blame the Germans is that the, the predominant European university model was developed by a guy called von Humboldt, and we heard about his brother who came here uh, as a natural scientist last, last evening. Um, he was the Minister of, of uh, Education in, in Prussia, and he developed the classic university model, a teaching research university that it has no other duties. Now, in Europe, we've taken a quarter of a century <laughs> to move from that dominant culture into one where universities now accept, by and large, that they have to do more than just teaching and research. They have to work with the community. They have to work with companies. They still have to be excellent at teaching and excellent at research. It's not an excuse not to do that. And I can hold up. You know, any of the universities you'll hold up as the best in the world, do it. They don't use the excuse. Um, Cambridge University has a, a total research budget of around uh, $500 million a year, one university, a relatively small university by European standards. More than, a th more, I think around two-thirds of that come from business. They do not come from the government. And that's the best university in the world. And it's been number one for the last two years. I'm sure you look at Harvard University, and you look at MIT, and you look at the proportion of their funding that does not come from national science foundations, it comes from business, and it's equally high. So the best universities in the world combine multiple sources of funding. They don't rely upon government. 
there are ethical issues about how you use government money and uh, the payback for that, but those are different questions. Gracias al tiempo voy a agrupar unas preguntas que tenemos para el doctor eh, Guillermo Fernández y unas para el doctor Peter, Peter Mitchell. Entonces, eh, hay muchas preguntas alrededor del FUMEC, eh, un poco unas alrededor de su naturaleza como una entidad no gubernamental y la facilidad que eso le da para operar, si bien recibe recursos públicos, no opera bajo un régimen público, hay, hay una pregunta alrededor de ese tema. Eh, en el caso del FUMEC, los empresarios fueron reacios a participar en el programa durante sus inicios. ¿Las empresas deben comprometerse a invertir recursos propios para desarrollar el programa? Eh, y esto es una pregunta muy relevante para el, el momento en la política pública en la que estamos y es acerca de la escogencia de los sectores estratégicos, de los nichos. Eh, si se revisan y cambian según las dinámicas del entorno, ¿cómo se hace esa revisión? O si son apuestas, como dice acá, no matter what. Eh, y para el doctor Peter Nick Jap nos preguntan de nuevo acerca del impacto sobre, de su estrategia de vouchers sobre la mentalidad de las universidades. Un poco creo que en los resultados nos hablaron un poco de los resultados eh, desde el punto de vista de, los emprende, de, lo, de las empresas, de las MIPIMES, pero no tanto eh, de la percepción de las universidades y la participación de las universidades. Esas son por ahora. Muchas gracias Catalina. Bueno, eh, en relación a un comentario que tú hiciste y que me gustaría eh, comentar también, ese brinco tú mencionaste de lo nacional a lo internacional, yo creo que precisamente lo que se busca es que, que no haya ese brinco, es decir, que las empresas trabajando aquí en Bogotá o en Medellín, en Cali, que lo que hagan localmente tenga el contexto internacional, sepan qué está pasando en el mundo en su campo, sepan quiénes son los principales actores, por qué son buenos, qué es lo que necesitan para seguirse desarrollando y que eso lo tengan en una forma continua y sistemática. O sea, eh, yo creo que en, la, en ese sentido lo que estamos llamando la globalización, pues tiene que ver también con que estemos preparados aprovechando lo mejor de lo que está pasando en el mundo para desarrollar nuestra propia capacidad y competir aquí mismo con todos los que vienen que obviamente están siendo apoyados y tienen muchos elementos que no tienen nuestras empresas acá. Eh, yendo a algunas de las preguntas que, que tú me hacías, eh, efectivamente el hecho de que FUME, que es una organización no gubernamental, nos ha dado una enorme flexibilidad de operación. Sin embargo, hay que reconocer, eh, FUME eh, tiene ante sus patrocinadores, que es fundamentalmente la Secretaría de Economía, el CONACIT, los gobiernos de los estados en México, una responsabilidad muy grande porque firmamos convenios que nos obligan a resultados y nos obligan a la transparencia, al manejo muy, muy abierto de todas las cuentas. Tenemos auditorías, tenemos toda clase de seguimientos para estar seguros de que todo se está manejando de una forma totalmente transparente y de acuerdo con los, lo que estaba previsto. Por otro lado, eh, también tenemos, eh, como tenemos eh, un patrimonio, tenemos una inversión de los gobiernos de México y de Estados Unidos, tenemos una inversión del orden de 22 millones de dólares, de ahí sacamos del orden de un millón y medio de dólares al año, que nos da como una base para poder analizar nuevos problemas y empezar a desarrollar nuevas estrategias, ir generando nuevas formas de, de desarrollarnos. Y, ese dinero también nos, nos compromete auditorías formales que hacen el gobierno de Estados Unidos y el gobierno de México a nuestras operaciones. Y tenemos que cumplir con toda una serie de, de compromisos muy, muy serios relacionados con auditorías. Eh, sin embargo, pues nuevamente, si uno hace su trabajo bien y llevando un cierto orden y teniendo cuidado de los papeles, eh, las cosas, pues al final de cuentas, funcionan sin mayor problema. Tenemos, y esto también es importante, eh, dos personalidades jurídicas, una en México y otra en Estados Unidos. Tenemos un, una sola junta de gobierno, un solo, eh, una sola estrategia de desarrollo, un solo equipo de trabajo, pero usamos las dos personalidades en función del problema que se, que se requiera. ¿no? Por ejemplo, el personal de las aceleradoras de Estados Unidos 
está contratado por la personalidad jurídica que tenemos en los Estados Unidos y eso nos libera de muchísimos problemas en la, en la operación allá. Eh, en cuanto a la inversión que hacen las empresas para participar en nuestros programas, nosotros eh, sí pedimos a las empresas que no cumplen con lo, los perfiles que nos permiten apoyarlas con recursos del gobierno, que cubran los costos. Eso eh, normalmente lo hacemos en una forma pues, muy abierta y nuevamente muy transparente para las empresas, aunque eh, en realidad eso no lo hemos promovido. Lo que buscamos es eh, principalmente cumplir con los compromisos que tenemos con los gobiernos, porque los, a nivel nacional o estatal, porque eso es lo que permite precisamente que tengan continuidad, sustentabilidad nuestros programas. Por otro lado, las empresas que sí apoyamos con recursos del gobierno, tienen que hacer una inversión por su cuenta para lograr cumplir con los eh, acuerdos que tenemos con cada una de ellas y, te, y que firmamos con cada una de ellas antes de empezar a trabajar con ellas. O sea, la empresa sí se compromete a realizar toda una serie de actividades que van cambiando y desarrollándose en función del plan de trabajo con ellas, pero al mismo tiempo se compromete a hacer una serie de inversiones y, por ejemplo, para las empresas que salen a las ECBAS, pues es una inversión fuerte porque tienen que enviar personal, tienen que eh, cubrir eh, a ese personal con otro, mientras esta gente está afuera, tienen muchas veces que contratar otros servicios complementarios a lo que nosotros les damos y todo eso significa una inversión importante. Estimamos que una empresa normalmente hace una inversión del orden de 200, 250, 300 mil dólares eh, en este proceso de aceleración antes de llegar a un punto en el que realmente tiene ya un flujo de ingresos suficiente para justificar todo esto. ¿no? Pero como ustedes vieron en los ejemplos, realmente las empresas lo ven como una inversión muy rentable. Ahora, hay casos en donde las empresas llegan y a muy pocos meses ya están vendiendo y la inversión que hicieron fue mucho menor, pero, pero son, yo, no, yo no diría que eso es la, la regla. ¿no? Y por último, en cuanto a los nichos, eh, dentro de los sectores que, que mencioné, bueno, la, la estrategia que nosotros hemos seguido y que ha apoyado la Secretaría de Economía, que, porque no ha sido un acuerdo explícito con la Secretaría de que solo vamos a trabajar en estos nichos, nos han dado mucha flexibilidad en ese sentido. Los nichos los hemos ido desarrollando en función de las empresas exitosas. O sea, el criterio para definir un nicho es que tenga empresas exitosas de entrada, de arranque. ¿Por qué? Porque el objetivo final del nicho es traer a miles de empresas, o cuando menos a cientos de empresas, las experiencias de las exitosas. Lo que queremos es que lo que se pueda lograr con las que tienen mayor éxito pueda fluir y pueda, pueda impulsar el desarrollo de muchas otras a través de los esfuerzos que se están haciendo en los nichos. ¿no? Entonces, en ese sentido, no estamos ante una decisión eh, circunstancial que puede cambiar de un momento a otro, estamos ante una decisión que se construye en función de las empresas exitosas y del potencial para desarrollar muchas otras empresas en las mismas áreas. The, uh, the science and research area is a very complex uh, animal, uh, and of course, in the middle is always the money, but there are many other elements around. But let me start from the money perspective, because we have money which goes directly into universities. We have money which is allocated through research funding councils, etc., and comes in through an indirect way which cannot be directly controlled by university management. We have industrial and other monies coming in into the university. And finally, uh, not an important source in many countries, we have philanthropical money, which is just based on gifts of, of uh, citizens, but for certain fields of research, like cancer research and medical research, a very important source of income. So we have all kinds of financial flows coming together in the university. At the same time, there are all kinds of clients. 
course, there are students who are clients of research. There is government. Uh, there are government agencies. There are international institutions. There's the industry. There is society at large. And maybe most of all, and very important, it is the taxpayer. So the collection of the money is already complicated. The spending of the money is complicated. And who at the end is the owner of all these complex flows of monies year in, year out? Um, I can tell you I have been for eight years uh, president of our National Research Council. So it's the, let's say, the Dutch uh, NSF. And each year and almost each month we had debates on not only how to spend the money, but also to convince the government, the Minister of Research, the Parliament, that more money should be spent on research. Now, if you tell them that we only need money for blue sky research, you would not get very much extra money. So you always have to tell them it's very important and we have some specific programs, maybe in water management or nanotechnology or, or archaeology, which is very important. We are very good there. So we need to invest in all these fields. And sometimes it helps. But it already indicates that in the decisions made in this complex system, most of the money is already earmarked. And the main question you have always is find a balance, a balanced portfolio to which, on the one hand, the ones who would like to do blue sky research should do so. They should never be prevented because this is of excessive importance for the future of our knowledge society. But there are other questions which call for more direct and more practical answers. And that, of course, means that also from that perspective, their wishes, and these are absolutely justified, have to be respected. So science policy um, is not just distributing the money, it's more on the perception and the views you have on the future of our society, what is important, what do we want to be, and where do, do we want to be. Um, when, I, when I was talking with uh, the Chinese leadership and I was giving my speech earlier today on China, they have a certain view on what they want to achieve, and money goes in that direction, which is important for their strategic goals. We have not yet been so strategic in our thinking, and Neither the industry is very strategic. It has a self-interest. But self-interest is not, in fact, the good driving force. Because if I talk with the president director of, let's say, Philips Microelectronics, I, he, of course, he would tell me, well, it's always good to invest more in microelectronics. That's very good, of course. But if I tell him, listen, but this is public money, and all the findings we get is public property, and they will all be published, even when they are about your own company, he says, no, no, we want to keep that secret. Then he said, but then you have to invest yourself. So we have to be cautious that industry, in fact, should also be aware to invest themselves in their own knowledge base. It cannot be transferred to the public sector. So there has to be, again, also this balance between the, uh, the private sector and the, uh, the public sector. Um, what we see increasingly, I find this at least in almost all European countries nowadays, each of the countries that chooses or tries to choose some sort of a niche model approach, which we also have heard before. What kind of niches is a certain country good at, and how do you want to improve that position? That can be in new materials, that can be in chemistry, that can be in water management, that can be in, in environmental technology, it can be in cancer therapy, and, and many other things. And you see more and more countries trying to identify a set of strong niches and increasingly, money goes into these niches, uh, which means that others who want to have a free uh, uh, research attitude might find it more difficult. Not impossible, but they would find it more difficult. Now, on the voucher system, then, which I uh, have described before, has it been successful? My answer has been uh, definitely yes, based on empirical facts and observations and perceptions of the, uh, the industry. Has it been good for the university? Yes, um, because it has changed a little bit the attitude of some researchers, namely that in academia, it is good to be sometimes confronted with practical questions. You're forced to go to a company um, 
and to see how they operate. And then you have to be smart. And since you are regarded as an intellectual person, you have to provide a solution. So it's a big challenge for university staff to come up with smart uh, solutions which are practical and are to be uh, accepted. So from that perspective, yes, it has been a, a reasonably good model also for the university system, but it has been supported by a change in the law. And the law in the past said the knowledge and university system is uh, only existing for two purposes, i.e. education first, second research. The second element which has been added recently into the law, at least in the Netherlands, says universities also do exist because of innovation and economic growth. And that has changed a little bit the attitude also of university management and of the boards of universities. It's in fact the same model which you described. Voy a hacer el anuncio parroquial antes de la última ronda de preguntas porque me lo están pidiendo los organizadores. Mañana tenemos al presidente Santos acá, dice que esto se le sale de las manos, que les da pena, pero que recuerden, por favor, sin escarapela no entra nadie, sin cédula, por favor no traer maletas, no traer eh, incluso hasta agua. Eh, un poco el mensaje es mañana, como tenemos presencia de presidente, las, eh, los organismos de seguridad van a estar desde temprano, entonces pues por favor su colaboración con el ingreso temprano y con ese tipo de detalles que son incómodos, pero desafortunadamente necesarios. Yo quisiera darles una última ronda a todos un poquito sobre el tema de la sostenibilidad. Eh, muchas de las organizaciones del ecosistema, llámese universidades o, o, u otras, dicen, mire, el tema de emprendimiento, si no tiene recursos públicos detrás, podemos generar algo de recursos propios, pero realmente este es un tema de, que requiere de inyección constante y permanente de recursos públicos, entonces me gustaría oírlos un poquito sobre el tema de, de sostenibilidad. Y un tema que mencionó Bob y que creo que, que se los oí a los demás y sale mucho y es el tema de, ok, tenemos la financiación y dónde están los proyectos. Aquí miro a mi amigo del Ministerio de, de las TICS, porque pasa mucho. Oye, aquí tenemos una plata, estamos esperando que lleguen los proyectos. Eh, el tema de los proyectos, qué experiencias y qué, qué nos pueden decir un poco acerca de ese, ese problema dentro de todo el tema de, del sistema de, de emprendimiento. Bueno, eh, la verdad es que para nosotros el gran reto ha sido tener buenas empresas. Eh, llegó un momento en el que ya nuestros procesos de búsqueda, de interacción con todo el ecosistema, pues ya no daba, ya no había más buenas empresas con las que pudiéramos realmente tener el perfil que necesitábamos. Eso nos fue llevando a consolidar cada vez más todo el esfuerzo del pipeline, le llamamos, que es eh, trabajar en preaceleración, trabajar desde los… Eh, parte básica de los nichos para ir construyendo la, las bases de las empresas. Eso nos ha dado eh, muy buenos resultados, pero sí implica eh, el hecho de que uno tiene que tener conciencia de que no es sentarse a esperar a que lleguen, es salir a buscar, saber dónde está el potencial y ayudar a desarrollar ese potencial. Esto me lleva a otra palabra que usé en la presentación, proactivo. Es decir, lo que, lo que hemos visto en la mayor parte de los esfuerzos que yo siento que han tenido éxito, y por ejemplo, hemos seguido muy de cerca algunos programas coreanos que han tenido muchísimo éxito, han partido de una gran proactividad de las organizaciones, de las eh, organizaciones empresariales del gobierno para lograr los resultados que se buscan. Es decir, yo creo que una estrategia basada en que yo tengo aquí algo muy bueno y me siento esperar a que alguien llegue a buscarlo, es una estrategia que solo se puede dar en ciertas condiciones muy especiales. ¿no? Eh, por otro lado, eh, yo creo que en cuanto a la sustentabilidad, eh, para mí, desde hace muchos, muchos años, eh, eh, ha quedado muy claro en que si eh, el, la empresa es un componente esencial de la sociedad y necesitamos más y mejores empresas, la sociedad en su conjunto y el gobierno como su representante tienen que ser instrumentos de apoyo para que haya más y mejores empresas. Entonces, eh, yo creo que en ese sentido, para mí no hay duda de que los programas que tienen más potencial, más posibilidad de éxito, son los que mantienen un esfuerzo permanente, sólido, bien pensado, estratégicamente diseñado del gobierno y con el respaldo de la sociedad. 
Yo creo que pensar en, en programas que tienen una chispa de, de recursos y que después los recursos desaparecen y se busca que en condiciones totalmente inapropiadas se trate de que sean autosuficientes, es tirar el dinero. Porque lo que no se va a lograr el objetivo y el dinero que se usó inicialmente no va a dar el resultado. Entonces, tiene que pensarse que el, el desarrollo de las empresas, el impulso a la generación de más y mejores empresas, sobre todo en un entorno global tan competitivo, a donde todos los países están apoyando a sus empresas, y cada vez con más fuerza, con más profundidad, con más elementos, hace que sea muy difícil que las empresas solas puedan tener todos los elementos para tener éxito en este, en este contexto global tan competitivo. Entonces, tiene que haber un compromiso de los gobiernos y ojalá y esto pues, se vaya convirtiendo en una realidad eh, ya concreta en países como, Colonia, perdón, como Colombia y México. Ok, I'm, I'm going to try to, to, to take another man angle. Uh, sustainability of science-based uh, innovation, if you want. Uh, point one, excellent research only. Mediocre research will not uh, give anything. So, will not give any technology which will be able to give a competitive advantage to a company. So, excellent research. Second, financing model. The balance between the public financing and the private financing. Uh, of course, like it was said before, uh, the appropriation of the intellectual property is very important. Public financing should be open results, open innovation, shared. Uh, the, the private investment, of course, it has uh, entitled, the companies are, in, if they pay, they are entitled to have the results. Uh, and there are many schemes to, to, balance, to balance this. Third, scientific employment. In Portugal, it's, it's a big debate, scientific employment, because now we have many PhDs and postdocs, etc., etc. We, have, we are even above the European uh, average. So what do we do with all those PhDs? What do we do with, with all those postdocs? The solution, university, is uh, 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 positions are uh, completely, uh, uh, completely filled up. Um, so they have to go to companies. They have to create their own companies. They are just a very highly qualified worker, and, but it's not enough for them to, to, to make their business. So it's important the, 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 to, to give a way out of people which are very highly qualified. And this has to be prepared before, before end. Uh, fourthly, new market niches. And fifth, be global. Uh, everybody, uh, from what I have heard in the morning and, 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 and in the afternoon, uh, uh, all the countries are uh, undergoing uh, societal transformations, uh, industrial transformations, and uh, transformations in the economic fabric, uh, which means that, that even traditional sectors uh, need technology to be more efficient be more environment compatible, uh, to be able to export and to survive. So traditional industry or so-called mature industry need technology and need, need technology-based science. And, then, and, and the, then the new niches, the, the emergent niches in, in, in health, in nanotechnologies, in environment, etc., etc. So the new niches will create new jobs, uh, certainly. Uh, and The public sector is also, or should also be, a client for knowledge, science, and technology, uh, because the public sector, it is said, that is frequently the most inefficient. Because if a company is inefficient, it goes bankrupt. If a public service is inefficient, it, nothing happens, or very slowly uh, it happens. So new business models, re-engineering, etc., etc., can be applied successfully to public sectors so that, that they can maintain or even increase the quality of the services while costing less to the public money. In Portugal now, the debate is the health, the health uh, sector. Uh, the health is improving dramatically in the last years, but the costs are improving dramatically also because doctors do not know how to manage and do not know enough how to absorb technology, etc., etc., etc. Um, the sustain well, I'm, I'm taking the question purely as a financial question because there's, there's another dimension of sustainability um, that, 
was hinted at this morning about when, when we've got population growth. Um, as a financial question, uh, we've got to recognize that some of these activities will not directly pay back, will not directly give revenue, and that therefore is something that has to be sustained by some transfer of resources. Now, the question then becomes the balance of the transfer and whether it is entirely a public responsibility to pay for these activities or whether it's a partnership. The question really comes from um, two angles. One, one is a distrust angle. Um, there have been far too many cases where sustained subsidies to particular activities have gone in the wrong direction and have not resulted in positive results. Therefore, we should distrust people and require them to um, be much more transparent about how they use resources. And, and what that comes to is, is an emphasis on one of two philosophies that underpin this, and that's the philosophy of purchasing. The government is purchasing certain services and should be an informed client and should therefore be able to insist on certain activities and certain outputs as a consequence of the services they perform. And we've heard a lot about transparency and accountability, and those things are all very important. What, what's equally important is a recognition that these activities are partnership activities for the society as a whole. It isn't just the government's responsibility. It isn't just the private sector's responsibility. We, we somehow have to have a sustained partnership between the two. There are ways of doing it that Sorry, the third dimension is, is transaction costs. If you require a program that you know will not generate commercial revenues every year to come back and build a case that it gets funded again for another year, and then to come back again at the end of that year to build a case to get funding for the next year, the transaction cost of that is extremely high. And the efficiency of that activity will be much lower as a consequence. Additionally, it won't be able to hire really top quality people because there's too much uncertainty as to whether the activity will continue. So we have to move to a mechanism where there is a sustained effort, and we're usually talking five to 10 years, but there are sufficient safeguards with the sustained effort that the public sector funder is getting enough value for money. And that's where the partnership becomes important. That's where building trust between the different actors becomes important. And that has to be a key part of the innovation system. It isn't something that you can avoid, but it isn't something that's easy either. Let me make three final remarks. First, Sustainability has a long-term perspective. The problem is, however, that society, governments, industries are so impatient because they would like to see immediately solutions, which of course is understandable, but not always feasible. Certain things will take a lot of time before we understand them and before issues will be solved. For example, we spend more resources, financial resources nowadays in cancer research than ever before, and more people are dying after cancer. An interesting but very complicated dilemma. And we know that we most likely will have to wait quite some time before we have found the proper solution. I give you one example from the history of science. Boolean algebra developed more than 100 years, almost 150 years ago. Buller was a, a, a theoretical mathematician. And when he started his algebra on zero and ones, everyone said, well, we have a decimal system. Why should, in fact, you spend your act all your work on zero and ones? Decimal systems are much more general than a zero and a one. But he developed interesting theorems, very theoretical. It was never applied, but fundamental work. Until after the war, in electroengineering, suddenly the computer came up with all the complicated switching techniques, which are in fact zero, one questions. And suddenly they found out there's this whole wealth of Boolean algebra which can help us 
to understand and to rapidly develop this field. Otherwise, it would not have been developed so fast. But it has taken more than 100 years before we got the full benefits of some very blue sky, high quality theoretical research. Two further small remarks. The basis, of course, of many of our decisions, policy, industrial, of course, is knowledge. And I just cannot resist quoting uh, Euripides, one of the uh, famous Greek uh, philosophers and policy advisors, when in one of the Persian wars, he gave a simple statement. He said, well, knowledge is more important than a strong arm. And that was just to prevent the Greeks from investing only in military equipment and not in knowledge anymore. So somehow there's an interesting balance. That brings me to a, a final uh, a remark, or again a, a citation from the former president of uh, uh, ETH, one of the high quality uh, educational institutes in Zurich, in Switzerland, when he said um, industrial capital is depreciating always when it is used. However, intellectual capital is not depreciating. It's the only resource which is not depreciating when it is used. And I think that justifies our investments in knowledge with all the conflicts and the complicated arenas which we have to go through with industry, government, and research sector. But this is certainly a, a clear justification because these are permanent and non-linear revenues which are far higher than initial investments. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, yo quiero agradecerle a este panel de lujo, realmente muy ilustrador para nosotros, muy relevante para el momento en el que estamos. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes y muchísimas gracias a todo nuestro panel por su tiempo y por sus exposiciones. Muchas gracias.